Hey guys, Jim here from Drink a Beer, Play a Game, and I love me some survival horror games. So with that being said, let's take a look at my PlayStation 1 and N64 horror game collection. We had to talk about Resident Evil at some point, and... This was my version of the original with the Director's Cut Greatest Hits DualShock Edition. Yes, this is the one with the terrible basement music. But here's the thing about that basement music. As a kid, with this being my version growing up with, I never realized that was wrong. I thought it was, you know, out of place, but it's still, like, weirdly out of tune, and to me that was unnerving. I think it actually fits in the game. I'm a defender of the awful basement tune. Sue me. But... Yeah, this, you know, Director's Cut version is awesome because, you know, you get the arrange mode, you get a lot of unlocks in there, different things to go back to and a way to play it, so you get more bang for your buck as far as a straight-up game goes. Plus the quality of life improvements that they added ever since the original vanilla version came out. So, when it comes to which way you should play it, there's an argument between the DualShock version and the regular Director's Cut, but I just think sticking with the Director's Cut either way is the way to go. And, yeah, I like that music. Who doesn't love Resident Evil 2? I mean, when it comes to PS1 era survival horror, for my money, this is the best experience out there. It took everything that one did and just did it so much better. The storyline's more fleshed out, you have two characters that you can switch back and forth with, and like before, the matter with you start with the one and then you play with the other, it actually like gives you different areas, different enemies, different boss fights, the story changes ever so slightly. And so basically starting with one person is kind of considered easy mode, the other one's hard mode and gives you like the truest of true endings for the game, but you have all the unlocks, the secret characters, just everything about this is basically perfection when it comes to 5th gen survival horror. The graphics are a lot better, the voice acting is still goofy but it's better, just that police station theme is an all timer, I just, this is one of my favorite horror games of all time, for a reason, and it is for many people as well. So while we're talking about Resident Evil 2, I would be remiss to not talk about the N64 port, which is a miracle of science with how they fit everything from the PS1 version onto an N64 cartridge. Sure, the graphics are a little muddier, uh, the FMVs are, you know, they're cut down for what they are, like, quality-wise. You get all of them here. And the sound has been, you know, very much compressed, but still... You get it all on an N64 game here. And even crazier is the fact that it plays really well. So I will say that using the analog stick to run around in a Resident Evil game, it's a little weird. So I tend to use the D-pad, but it's cool you have both options. But yeah, this thing really, really holds up well. And I have to give a special shout out to my retro tank because this game famously switches resolutions when you go into the menu and when you play the game. But... Yeah, my capture card didn't skip a beat thanks to that retro tank, so kudos to that. But even besides all that, if you can get your hands on this, it's not cheap now. But it, in my mind, it is a must for N64 owners. And unfortunately, it is my only horror game on the N64 that I own. Thank <laughs> you. 
So, we talked about the other Resident Evils, so let's round out that original trilogy with Resident Evil 3 Nemesis. And you know what? I still like this game a lot. Like, this game really, like, its core focus is the cat and mouse game between Nemesis always chasing Jill. In a lot of ways, though, it improved the gameplay with, you know, the different weapons and the different things you could kind of choose in-game, like, in the over-the-top action scenes. It was kind of the start of the action phase and it was also just i don't know in a lot of ways it's kind of unmemorable at this point as far as like the story goes like the secondary characters are probably some of the worst you've ever had but as far as the game goes i think it's still a fun time just after one and two though you kind of had that burnout along with it's just not as good at that point either but as with all the resident evil games if you want to check out the reviews that we did links will be below where you can see our full thoughts on this Now let's switch it up a bit with the original Silent Hill. And for a while, there is a huge argument whether Silent Hill or Resident Evil was the better series. And you could honestly make a strong argument for Silent Hill because where Resident Evil is a great horror survival horror game, this is that but also really unsettling and unnerving. Even from the very start. Like, this game is just a mind trip. And... It's got the same problems with PS1 horror games with the tanky-ish control. And, like, going back to it now, it's a little rough to actually play. But the storyline, the setting, everything that goes on, it's basically like a nightmare in a game. Which is what Silent Hill was known for when it was good. So, yeah, every great series has to start somewhere. And this is where it started. And my god, it was a good start. Ah, next up is a game I have so much nostalgia for from a magical weekend where my buddies and I rented it and played it, and I didn't touch it again for like 20 years, and that is Overblood. So this is another one of those Resident Evil clones that came out after the first one, jumping onto that survival horror kick uh, by EA, and yeah, it doesn't hold up as much as I thought when I was a kid. It's like, if you think Resident Evil is clunky... You have seen nothing yet until you've seen this game. The voice acting is still weirdly bad, even though it came out later. It's got these little flourishes where it kind of looks cool and like runs pretty smooth, especially when you're using the little robot helper. But there's other times where it's just like, you go through the first hour or so of the game without seeing a single enemy or getting to a single save point. So, hey, it's Jim from the future. And yeah, it's actually very easy to save in this game. You like can do it right away so i'm an idiot anyway back to the video if you screw up you're going through so many puzzles and cinematics again and again until you just get it right which is really frustrating so it's got a lot of flaws to it but i'll always have a little soft place in my heart for the first time i sat down with it so if you can find it for super cheap might be worth a pickup but just don't expect anything all that great So next up is going to be a series that's oddly just forgotten almost in this day and age. 
And that's Fear Effect. So this game, it's got its problems because a lot of it, and I'll be honest with you, I haven't gotten that far in it yet. I've barely touched it, but the first thing that jumps out is the amazing graphics. Like the cell shade animation in this game, along with the polygons, it just blends together so well where you go from like Resident Evil 1 where like mouse don't even move as people talk to like fully voiced and animated and facial features. Like the graphics blow me away in this game. Um, the control is, you know, it's typical old school tank control, but it's definitely like based off what Resident Evil started, but it's definitely its own thing. It's much more story based, much more stealthy. The boss fights are complete BS from what I hear. I don't even think I've gotten to one yet. So, yeah, um, it's got its reasons, I guess. I never touched the second one, but from just what I can see, it's just kind of so weird that like a noir-ish take on survival horror kind of didn't take off more than it did. So, I don't know. Maybe I'll have to sit down fully and give it a review one day. All right, and we're going to finish up with the PS1 with my only Castlevania game on the PS1. And ah, surprise, it's not Symphony of the Night, it's Castlevania Chronicles. Yes, I don't own Symphony of the Night. And at this point, it's pretty darn expensive and more than I want to pay for it. Plus, I already have it on some other consoles, so it is what it is. This, though, interesting little guy. This is a port of the Sharp X68000 remake of the original. Yep, and it like comes with arranged modes, it comes with different things to it, and it's hard. This is such a hard, unforgiving version of the original Castlevania. Oh, and they added in more levels too, which is always a nice part. So you do get some extras, you get some arranged modes, you get some different music options because the 68000 had different modules. So it's a cool little package. It's just, yeah, it's super tough though. So... It's probably not the best way to play the original Castlevania, but it's a very interesting way. So, this is not cheap at all anymore. So, if you can get your hands on it for a decent price under 100 bucks, do not hesitate, jump on it. But I would still say it's also not a must-own if you're a Castlevania fan. It's more of an oddity, but it's a cool one. Glad I have it. Alright guys, that'll do it for this video. As always, if you enjoyed it, please hit that like button below. Leave a comment. Let me know what essential horror games, besides Simply the Night, that I know that I'm missing from my collections that I should really try and check out and that aren't too expensive. And as always, if you enjoyed this video, make sure to check out my other horror collection videos, including the NES and Super NES, or the Sega Genesis, or any of Brian's old collection videos. Until next week, guys, when I take a look at some odds and ends, cheers.